Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the, this evening's talk. We, um, uh, Mr. Andrew Sheng needs no real introduction. Um, and there's been a slight shift of topic, so let me just say that you know Andrew is one of the giants um, in, in two very important fields. Uh, first and foremost, he has extremely deep and senior experience as a financial sector regulator and, um, and central banker, of course. And um, here, he's, of course, um, served as Chairman of Securities and Futures Commission of Hong Kong, uh, HKMA, um, Bank Negara, and he's, a, he's also a board member of the China Securities Regulatory Commission and Securities and Exchange Board of India. So, you know, um, India, China, Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, all the key Asian economies he served regulating the financial sector, thinking about central banking at the highest levels. But more than that, Andrew is also a thinker and an analyst at the, at the, at the most rigorous conceptual, theoretical, as well as uh, at policy levels. So in this, he's written several important books on the Asian crisis, which, you know, talking to Anup just now, um, not just the Asian crisis, the global financial crisis, which you know, Andrew has always thought began in Asia, and Anup here, I'm seeing from, from is, is worried will finally end up in Asia as well. But uh, be that as it may, Andrew is also in his role as adjunct professor, professor at Graduate School of Economics, Tsinghua University and Beijing University, University of Malaya, as well as Distinguished Fellow of Asia Global Institute, University of Hong Kong, a key thinker and thought leader in this field. So tonight, he's going to shift a little from the original title of what have and haven't we learned from the financial crisis. He's going to go a little bit more into the future, ask the forward-looking question, um, um, where, where is the Asian financial system heading? The Asian financial system, as you know, will eventually serve what will be the largest economy the, the world has ever seen, right? Asia and China together, uh, China and India together, Chindia will be eventually nine times the size of Japan in, in a couple of decades. So what is the financial system that serves this gigantic economy going to look like? Is it going to learn from the lessons of the past? Can it morph from a short-term oriented, debt-heavy economy into something more efficient, something more equitable, something more relevant? And I leave the rest to Andrew. Andrew, please. Thank you, uh, Lam Kyung, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, the trouble with great introductions like that is that one can never fulfill uh, the expectations. Uh, I, um, I was, uh, uh, when I came in, uh, somebody I greatly admired in Singapore, Mr. J.Y. Pillay, said that I'm the person who got Lam, Lam Kyung to wear a tie. And I said that I wore a tie because, just because Mr. J.Y. Pillay is here. <laughs> you know, those of us who, uh, who have participated in, uh, if I may say, that nation building can only admire what Singapore has achieved in 50 years. So, and uh, people like J.Y. <coughs> have been part of that. And, 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 and Lam Kyung, of course, and all of you know what, what has been achieved. But the topic I wanted to talk about today uh, is about Asia's financial system in transition, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, what can we learn from what happened in the 20th century, and uh, how, do, how should we think about Asia? Because we had the Asian crisis uh, literally 15 years ago, uh, 17 years ago, sorry. Um, and uh, since then, 10 years later, you know, to, from 1997, uh, 2007, we had the subprime. And now 2017, is it time for another global financial crisis? And will it come back to Asia? That is obviously a key question. The reason why I wrote that book called From Asian to Global Financial Crisis was that the traditional Western view of Asian financial crisis was we were to blame. And I said it wasn't that simple, okay? 
uh, and and it, it, the the fundamental story in that book, which is available in Cambridge University Press here, uh, is that actually instead of blaming the hedge funds, the 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 problems of the Japanese economy, which was then the largest economy in Asia, lent most to Asia through Hong Kong and Singapore. The contraction of that gave Asia a heart attack. But the story has turned out to be even more complex than that, which is the story of the Asian uh, global financial crisis. And my next story, which I want to show a little bit, I, I want to be a little bit more positive than what the newspaper is reading uh, to show you how one should begin to think about these sort of issues. What I really want to say is the global financial crisis has turned finance on its head. Okay? The theory of finance is mostly wrong. And for those of you who are asset managers uh, using risk models, would know that those risk models not only did not prevent the crisis, they actually misled. The uh, best example of this was that UBS in 2007 had a value at risk model which said the maximum they could lose was 50, 50 million US dollars. They lost 2 billion. Okay? And, 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 and so it's a, it's a, I, I hate to use this in front of JY Pillay who, for Singapore Airlines, who built Singapore Airlines, but it's like a, you know, a pilot. Those who fly by the black box die by the black box. Right? You know, if you look too much, concentrate on, the, on, on, on your dials in front of you, instead of looking clearly ahead where you're heading, chances are you make mistakes. Now the debt driven model, everybody complains that the whole world is flush with debt. It's unsustainable, it's fragile, it creates inequality, and you know, it, it's something that we need to get out of. Right? Uh, the business model is really changed because anybody who is a traditional incumbent bank has suddenly discovered fintech. If the regulators were not protecting the banks, it's blown out of the water. Okay? And people haven't, haven't, haven't got, got ground to this. And how do we you know, get rid of this excess credit creation uh, is that we need to create better debt markets, uh, equity markets, rather than debt. And so my final message is very simple. We are currently looking at the 21st century in a world of great change and confusion with 20th century glasses. And that's when it's very dangerous, okay? Because we cannot look backwards, we really need to look forward. Now, the, the first point, let's talk a little bit about the world very quickly, right? Time-wise. Here is everybody talks about China, one belt, one road, silk roads, etc. I was there. I went to Tun Huang, I stood there, and I had a eureka moment. The Eureka moment was because when I look at those caravans, I ask myself, could these caravans have been financed by debt? And the answer is impossible, right? Maybe one in four will survive across the desert. They will be lost in the desert. They'll be blown away by desert storms. They will have robbed on the desert. When they get there, they will have the local government tax them, rob them. They will be cheated. And you know, they may not get what they want, and when they will come back, they will get lost, they'll get robbed, etc. etc. So but by the time they came back, but they still went. So can you imagine a bank in Singapore lending to them collateralized 10%, 15% with Basel III risk weights, you know, of 15%? It won't work. Because the chances of you losing 100 percent of it is very high. But they still went and people made money. Why? Because it was 100% equity driven. Right? The caravan captain should have an equity in it, the, lend, the, the investor has the equity in it, but if one in four comes back, I am richer than Shylock. Right? But this is Islamic finance. And that's the origins of Islamic finance, which is not interest driven, but equity driven. And that's the problem in the world today. We are now facing massive changing risks which we cannot predict. So the, the glowing uncertainty is very unusual. We have now in one picture where the US owes out of 60 trillion debt, you know, nearly one third, right? 
GDP-wise, the world's economy, the US is number one, 23.3%, China is only 13.9%. Okay, so you know, it, it gives you very quickly, you can see this. And if we want to see what's gonna to happen to us 2025, 20, you know, uh, 2030, the US National Intelligence Council predicts that the global growth will slow, and I agree with that, the, but the emerging markets will still grow faster than uh, advanced markets, AME is advanced market economies, but the climate change risks, we have now seen the hottest, coldest, in, 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 even in Hong Kong, Hong Kong just had ice, uh, 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 you know, uh, coldest, in, in, you know, and drought and all these are changing. We have now seen a multipolar world because it's no longer one single hegemon, you know, it's no, it's no longer a unipolar world. We have growing potential for conflict and we can't borrow like this because debt is very fragile. If the bank has, uh, 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 gets back from me, I'm dead. So I need more equity, right? The banks need more equity. Now, the projections by McKinsey, and this coincides with the paper that I'm writing, uh, you know, uh, it will be published in about June, May, June about emerging market finance. This is the whole results of my work on this area. Is that the emerging market share of the financial assets will double by 2020. It will be roughly, financial assets of the emerging markets will be roughly equal to that of the rich countries by 2050, somewhere in that long, long, long lines. Now, there's six transformative trends why we need to rethink finance. The first one is very straightforward. Multipolar Cold War 2.0. We're now talking actively about war. You know, I mean, the, we didn't dreamt about it before, but last year, one of my worries was something will happen, an accident will happen in South China Sea, okay? But it was never out in my radar screen. And I couldn't imagine that there would be another more bombs going off here than everywhere. The demograph, demography, North Asia is aging. You know, but ASEAN, India, very young population, right? The median age of an, an Indian is 26, if I'm not wrong. For Chinese, it's 37. For Japanese, it's 47, if I'm not wrong. Okay? The average age of a Japanese farmer is 67 years old. Right? 30 years ago, four Japanese workers, one retiree. Currently, two, re two workers, one retiree. 20 years from now, one worker, one retiree. I mean, the worker is going to do nursing for the retiree, you know. So how, 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 how are we going to survive, right? Uh, so, you know, but there's also the financial and debt overhang. Who's going to pay for this? There's also disruptive technology. Ten years from now, one in five jobs will disappear because it'll be re replaced by robotics, right? There will be many changes, there are all these things. And there's climate change we've talked about, and then governance. Is it going to be democracy, market, or state? But the problem is, we have the mother of all monetary creation in the last seven years. Who's going to pay for this? My answer is very simple. The advanced company, countries won't pay for it, we pay for it. Emerging markets will pay for it from lost jobs, adjustment, and all these. Right? Because from the advanced countries, the reserve currency countries, G4, what I call G4, they have a soft budget constraint. They can print all the money you want because you and I, the surplus guys, are going to be able to buy it. We have a hard budget constraint because we can't print money. Okay? So we have an actual imbalanced situation in the global economy. Now, but why are we walking deeper into the debt trap? You know, yesterday Adair Turner already said, Japan is the canary in the coal mine. He was already saying we were the first one to have the big bubble of all bubbles and then we had 20 years of, you know, lost growth. Okay, and then we were the first one to go into QE. We told you, you know, Mr. Bernanke, we told you, Mr. King, you know, we told you don't get into QE. They went into QE and hallelujah, they're repeating what uh, Japan experienced, right? And then, surprise, surprise, the Chinese also walked into the same issue. Isn't that interesting, right? So the question is, we have now, this is BIS Claudio Barrio, uh, who is the most brilliant, I think one of the best analysts of this, together with Hyun Shin in the BIS. We are walking into a debt trap. We have downward bias in interest rates since 85. Interest rates keep on going down, and upward bias in debt. Low interest rate means bubble. 
Everything is financed by the capital asset pricing model. You and all the finance theory is based on capital pricing model, which says that the value of all assets is the discounted cash flow by the interest rate. But what happens when the interest rate is negative, which is not supposed to happen, but it's already real? The value of the asset is infinity. So are you surprised in 2015, we had the mother of uh, asset bubbles, mother of uh, commodity prices, mother of real estate uh, prices, and then the minute it starts deflating, the whole world shakes. Okay? So, the global debt, McKinsey is saying, you know, global debt increased by 57 trillion since the world, since 2007, outpacing world growth. Right? And, but look at this, this is very simple numbers taken from the IMF. You take the world's financial assets, which is roughly 200 and uh, sorry, about 300 uh, trillion. Uh, that stock market, uh, debt market, and bank, bank. I re make a very crude assumption. That's why it's a crude leverage ratio. Divided by the stock market cap, you get a crude ratio. Okay, because if the stock market is very big, and all the companies are financed by capital, like Alibaba and Amazon. Okay, Amazon doesn't worry about PE ratios because they use their market cap and cash flow to grow, right? So the, 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 if you really want to look who got into trouble, you look at Europe, it's got a lever, crude ratio of six, six, 600%, and China is now gone to 700%, right? So there was a huge debt equity mismatch in the, in, in, you know, in the world. Now, the problem is that financial repression causes huge inequality. Central bank reserve assets are now 22.6 trillion, 8% of global financial assets. Before the crisis, 3% only. And then they say they have nothing to do with low interest rates, they have nothing to do with inequality. I'm sorry, I disagree. Central bankers cannot live on the moon. They are part of us. They are not independent of the whole world. They are part of us. And in Davos, we had this Oxfam paper which said 62% of the richest people in the world own more assets than the bottom 50% of the world. How did that happen? How can it happen? In fact, it accelerated far faster than even off Oxfam provided. QE. Zero interest rate allowed the rich to borrow and invest in assets that the poor cannot because the poor cannot borrow. It's as simple as that, right? The 80%, 83% of the world's equity market cap is supported by zero interest rate policy. 50% of the world's government bonds yield 1% or less. When the interest rate bonds went, went to zero, Zurich Re did a calculation of how much pension funds lost in terms of negative you know, wealth available to pay pension funds. Something like about $250 billion. Okay. So, you know, the, the ZERP, you know, QE is not costless, right? And of course, you know, uh, government bond yields fell to all-time lows, and that is the mother of all bubbles in the bond market. Now, the, the, the BIS is also saying that not only that the real sector, which is this brown line, has fluctuated, the financial cycle, the blue line, has grown bigger and bigger. And it's not surprising it's bigger and bigger because of leverage. It's all the debt. The more you borrow, the more you depend on lower interest rate, the more you have credit creation, the, 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 the interest rate get lower, and the more you intervene in the market, the larger quantity you have to adjust to get the price stability that you want. Now there's another paper which basically shows that financial booms sap productivity by misallocating resources. And Adair Turner said this, you know, most of the loans of banks is not supposed to go for investment, it's going for financing property. Okay, and of course, you know, we now come back to the 1930s story, which is Irvin Fisher. Now, Irvin Fisher is the, one of the saddest economists ever, because in 1929, he said the boom will go on forever, and then the crash happened. But out of this, he wrote this Fisher debt deflation theory, which says that there are nine steps from cycle to depression. Uh, Adair Turner talked about this. You First of all, you have a displacement. You have a boom, like the tulip. Uh, bubble, you know, like the technology at the moment. 
How do you value how much is Uber worth, Facebook worth? You know, how can the PE ratio be 200 to 1? In fact, companies don't even make money, but they're valued at billions. That's a bubble, okay? Then, of course, you know, the, the, the debt, uh, so people borrow money to speculate in the bubble. It's exactly what happens. And then the debt equation, contraction of deposit currency, fall in level of prices, which we are now worried about. And then the fall in the network of business, fall in profits, reduction of output, pessimism, hoarding, and complicated disturbance in the rate of interest. So it's a very simple story, but it has come true, you know, in long cycles. Now, here, if you really look at what has happened, we had a big displace, displacement you know, in, in, in the recent past. The US current account deficit rises. The US can pay for all its current account deficit by printing more money because everybody wants US dollars, right? How did the Chinese accumulate uh, 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 foreign exchange reserves of $4 trillion? Exports, right? And exporting to whom? Mostly to the Americans. So, you know, if the Americans can export and get, just give you a piece of paper, you want it back, they give you another piece of paper, right? And of course, they, even on the piece of paper, the interest rate is below your inflation rate. So, very happy for them, very happy for you, everybody very happy. Okay, but the problem is, the surplus countries now finance this, and US begins to lose monetary control in what is called the Triffin Dilemma, right? Triffin Dilemma says that if the US is the reserve currency of the world, the US has to print more money for the rest of the world, but it actually doesn't suit the US monetary conditions, which is exactly what happened. And Ben Pernanke complained about it under the 205 excess savings argument. Now in stage three, guess what happened? If the dollar is the currency, both the Europe, which is running a current account's net balance, but essentially German banks run very large surpluses, they started borrowing dollars and marking all the assets off balance sheet and they're offshore. So when the subprime crisis occurred, the Europeans says, ha ha ha, this is a US problem. Forgetting that it was European banks borrowed US dollars, invested in all the subprime, and they lost their shirt. And then the Europeans got into trouble, and then the European governments got into trouble by bailing them out and increasing their debt. Right? So that's the subprime and EU crisis, both of which were solved by QE and zero interest rate policy. And guess what? In, in, two, in, in stage five, the Chinese said we will have a four trillion uh, stimulus package to compensate for all this, and then it turned out to be a 40 trillion credit splurge, which is why now everybody complains about the Chinese uh, over debt increasing, etc., forgetting that it was that splurge that bailed out Australia with high commodity prices, bailed out Canada, bailed out the rest of the world, etc., etc., and now too bad. You're the sucker to go into the game. You're the bad boy, right? But that's life, so we don't worry too much about it. So the, 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 the 207, we now have a peak Asia intervention, global slowdown. We are now back into a global debt deflation story. Now, the guy who wrote, is the most thoughtful guy on this, is a, uh, uh, is a guy who works for Nomura called Richard Ku, and he kept on saying, the Japanese got into trouble because of a balance sheet crisis. You economists talk all about flows. You know, GDP is a flow. You know, currency uh, uh, movement is a flow. You forgot about the balance sheet. And when the Japanese companies started rebuilding their balance sheets because of excesses that they refuse to spend, the consumer doesn't spend, and the result is, you know, slower and slower uh, deflation in the situation. There was a huge wealth loss when the uh, Nikkei bubble collapsed. People tend to forget this. In December 1989, the Nikkei was just short of 40,000. Okay? So 25 years later, the Nikkei index still hasn't got beyond 18,000. So actually, you've lost, if you've invested in the Nikkei stock exchange at that time, you would lose their shirt. Um, so now, you know, having painted this big picture, let me think a little bit about the Asian financial crisis, and the, the, a lot of this is not Andrew Sheng doing this, it's actually taken from the IMF. Now my good friend and mentor, uh, Anup Singh, who is now retired from the IMF, and I'm not blaming you, I'm praising you, uh, initiated this study, which I thought is very good, because you know, uh, under Anup, they led a team to start thinking about what is the future of Asia, how does the future of Asian finance. Now, 
the basic story is as follows. If Asia becomes a major player, and Asia will become a major player because more than 40% uh, of the world's population is in the world, and Asia remains the fastest growing economy, everybody wants to talk about Chindia. They forget ASEAN itself is a huge uh, 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 growth area. And, and uh, of course, uh, South Asia, other than India, is also you know, huge, uh, very good uh, demographics. Now, the, the IMF argues that Asian finance need to better manage, better manage accumulated savings, efficient mobilized savings, investing human capital, deepening capital markets to escape middle trap, and supporting economic and financial integration of ASEAN. Absolutely right. Except how the hell do we do, it, do this? Okay, that, that's, the, that's the trick of the game. Now, I uh, uh, wrote this paper and I did a stylized facts on emerging market uh, uh, finance. And so, you know, it may not be true of uh, individual economies, but broadly taken as a whole, it's about right. So I'm just going to be very quickly running, run, you know, run through this. Number one, emerging, emerging market GDP and finance grew faster than advanced market. So by and I, we're still faster. We start on a small base, but we're still faster. Financial sector basically dominated by banks. In China, banks is about you know 90% uh, of the financial assets. You know, insurance companies and all this are very small, right? Equity markets have grown very rapidly, but you add them all up. Emerging markets only 18% of world market cap, but still half of EME's share of world GDP, which is 38, 39%. So our capital market is still very small. Our banking market is very big. So it, we have a, that's why we have a, a crude leverage ratio very high. Our financial derivative markets is very small. Although Korea has some, Singapore has some, Hong Kong has some, the rest of the markets are essentially non-derivative markets, mostly fairly straightforward stock market, you know, bond markets, banking markets. And then our share of world forex, forex is now 8 trillion, or two-thirds of the world forex belongs to the emerging markets. So it's the emerging markets that are financing G4, you know, the reserve currency countries of US, uh, uh, Europe, uh, uh, Japan, and, 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 and UK. And then global capital flows are getting larger and larger. Okay, and they go larger and larger, and a lot of this is actually the carry trade. The carry trade is basically I borrow one currency and invest in another. Okay, and this is very relevant. And, but emerging markets lack long-term institutional investors. If you go to Singapore, if you go to Hong Kong, you go to Japan, you will probably see maybe 300 institutional investors, right? You go to Hong Kong, you probably see 20, 30 large institutional investors, the rest relatively small funds. You know, in Singapore, it's broadly around the same. But you go to London, you go to New York, you're doing thousands of deep institutions. That's why, you know, in, in a sense, if you look at our insurance and pension asset and management in Asia as a whole, they're less than 20% of GDP compared with 64% in Eurozone and 152% in the US. The US remains the world's last, largest asset manager. Okay? The biggest pension, the biggest uh, fund managers, insurance companies. But what has happened now is as Asia becomes wealthy, half of the fund lending in Asia are now by itself. And it makes a lot of sense. If Asians are rich because we are no longer net borrowers from the rest of the world, it makes sense for us to lend to each other. And that's what Singapore is doing, Hong Kong is doing, which is very good. Now, what are the areas of reform? What do we need to move our system into the 21st century? And the answer is we need to think beyond QE and Basel III to have regulation and design fit for purpose. right? I have always been against the term best practice, because best, who's best practice? Well, if it's in New York, it's best practice. Is it best practice here? Not necessarily. What is good for the United States may not necessarily be good for us, right? It could be good for us, and it's good to copy them, but if it doesn't fit local conditions, it can't be right. <coughs> so it actually should be fit for purpose. What is our problem? So obviously, we need to shift towards long-term funding. We need to uh, uh, reduce financial repression. We need to increase equity capital trade finance. We need to go for long-term infrastructure. We need to identify vulnerabilities in shadow banks. And we need to use a combination of technology and institutional design. And we need better regional cooperation. Now, these are all mother's pie stuff that you're, you've heard a lot about, and you can immediately go to sleep. What I really want to talk about is that equity markets, the reason why we have got more debt than equity is very straightforward. 
we are biased against equity. Okay? If you borrow money, you get interest tax deductible. Your non-performing loans are interest deductible. If you borrow, if you get equity, it costs you a lot to get an IPO. In fact, it costs 7% to list an IPO in the United States before accounting and all the investment banking fees, etc. Okay? And then, on top of that, your dividend is often double taxed. The company pays tax. Normally, they don't give you 100% of the dividend. They only give you 25% or 40% of the profits or whatever. And then the tax is deducted as source. And if you are a poor guy, you never claim from the government. And then you are tax double. Because you're taxed as source and you're taxed, you know, your own income tax, right? And then your losses on stock market is not tax deductible. Plus the fact that if I am actually an owner of a company, I prefer to leverage. Because the more I leverage, you know, the more my profits relative to me, but actually my risks increase and my systemic risk increases. The whole system, if it becomes very leveraged, becomes extremely fragile. Right? So the resource allocation was dysfunctional. The price discovery, as I said, we never dreamt interest rates could go to negative was bad. The risk management is worse because the models don't work. The corporate governance is worse. Not only the banks are the least trusted by the Edelman Trust Indicator, the banks which are supposed to be the corporate governance discipline, they discipline the creditors are supposed to discipline the debtors. They couldn't even discipline themselves. And that's how they got into trouble, right? But the fourth function of financial systems is to understand that in this complex world, we are living in an ecosystem. And that everybody learns. And that, you know, crisis is part of the learning process. If you don't learn the mistake, you will go into crisis and you will repeat it. And so, the crisis that we are seeing in the world has proven, especially the global crisis, that even the best of the countries, the best of the regulators, the best of the central bankers make mistakes. The only thing that we hope for is that they learn what they went wrong and how do they move forward. Okay? So we, you know, we should see this positively. Now, how do we adapt the equity market to best fit? And this is where the mistake was. Because the, as part of the World Bank before, I was a part of a guy who went to the countries and preached them, if you take New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ and plunk it in your country, you would have succeeded. You get what you call deep markets. Wrong. In fact, most stock markets around emerging markets are casinos. Okay? And the trouble is that the retail is finding, is, is beginning to desert the markets. In Malaysia, for example, the market was very retail driven. You clean up the market, the, mar the, the, the retailers decide, whoops, I'm not making money, you know, the corporate governance is problematic, the data is problematic, uh, and then I have no chance against quant trading, algorithms, uh, shorting. The retail cannot short, the big funds can short. Okay, let me give you an illustration. I, I just want a very simple story, right? I was puzzled by this tech bubble. So I invested in a small, my money, no, my pension, I don't owe anybody anything. I invested in it to see what happened. And I bought a company at 20 cents, 20 cents. A very good company, a company that actually uh, uh, has a good story, actually made profits, not a loss maker, okay? And then the company, to my surprise of surprise, went from 20 cents, went to $3, six months. And then, before I even had a chance to sell, bam, it went back to 20 cents. <laughs> now, that raises a very interesting question. I have to ask this, because I'm a former securities regulator. Okay, I don't blame anybody. Okay, I don't blame anybody. But it suddenly struck me that a retail investor is in deep trouble. Because if the buyer of that stock is a quant fund driven by by algorithms, the regulator can't arrest a, a computer program for insider dealing. Because we program the computer to say, and the computer is lock, logged into the big data, so they log into whole of the, the, the stock markets and the commodity markets, every market in the world, they, they do a 
black box computer computerization, any stocks that move in a certain manner, buy. Any stocks reach a certain level, sell. Okay? Now, you are here looking at the stock market every day, diligently studying the pages or even going to Bloomberg or Reuters. <laughs> Suddenly you see the stock market going up and this is a good company. The PE ratio does look not bad. The management doesn't look bad. You, I go and buy. Suddenly you say, oh, it went up double. Then it went double, treble. And so you, go, you, go, you follow. By the time you follow, they've already sold out. And, and it won't go back because this stock price still hasn't gone back, back up. Right? But, the, but just give the illustration, the game is changing because 60% of the big turnover in all these global markets is computer driven. Right? So the technology, how do we use technology? How do we use infrastructure funding? Right? How do we deal with this governance in this new world? So there are lessons from the A share market and the Silicon Valley lessons that change my way of thinking. So as a former securities regulator, as a former finance guy, I suddenly realized the reason why we got into trouble, it was because the lenses that I was wearing, the mindset that I was thinking was wrong. Now, where did it happen? You see, what happened in the A share market was that the government saw that exactly what you saw. We have external savings, we have excess savings. Our savings can either go to bank deposits or go to stock market or go to property markets. This, the, the, the Asia market was the strangest market. The, the economy was the fastest growing economy, the stock market was the worst performing. Right? So the retail investors said, well, you know, now that the economy is beginning to turn, maybe you know, the, the stock market could turn. And of course it should turn because what the government should be doing is to, you know, if they want to deal with the state-owned enterprise, you want to deleverage the economy, you should get the market up. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, not mistakes were made in the, in the, in the actual handling of it, but essentially the Chinese understood from practice, not from theory, that to develop a stock market needs multi-level stock markets. What do you mean by multi-level stock markets? It's exactly like university. You cannot expect a schoolboy to go into Stanford immediately. You cannot expect an SME to go immediately to become listed to a public listed company. What you need is to go stage by stage. Okay? So what the Chinese have done has to move into multi-level markets in which in the city level they have created over-the-counter uh, uh, property exchanges in which the non-listed equity of SMEs and middle-sized companies are now transferred amongst PE fund venture capitalist private equity guys. And then they started, that, and they consolidate that to call it the third new market. And then recently I was in China, one of my students is running what is now called the fourth new market. It is a little bit of ideas borrowed from Silicon Valley in which the city government get all the startups, SMEs, and train them how to think about fundraising business model. It is the nursery that goes into the primary school of the third new market that eventually moves on to the more sophisticated area and then finally go for listing. And from there, you go to the Olympic Games of New York, Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or the London Stock Exchange. Okay? So actually, it's an ecosystem that you now need to learn, and it's, it's quite simple. The second idea from Silicon Valley, which I now finally began to understood, came from the inspiration from the first slide I showed you about the caravan. The conventional theory is that with perfect information, with you, if you have a risk which you can identify, you can hedge it. But if you cannot identify that risk because there are too many black swan, how do you hedge against an unknown unknown? Answer, portfolio investments. In Silicon Valley, I do not know who will become Alibaba, who will become Facebook. But if I invest in a thousand SMEs with bright ideas, with good professors, with good you know, venture capitalists, <laughs> nursing them up, all I need is one of them to be a unicorn to strike a billion, I can write off my losses to the 999 other startups. Okay? And that's exactly what has happened in biology. You know, 
the turtle lays 500 eggs. All right? 80% might not even go beyond the beach. Just going down, they'll get eaten up by people who, you know, dig up the, the, the nest. You know, the birds eat them, they go down. But they still survive because even that 3% which go, 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 go into the water, eventually some of them grow up and then they will return to lay the eggs. And that's portfolio theory. You do not know which of the eggs will succeed, which of the startup will succeed. And now we need to be build this ecological system within our societies to get it succeed. So on that kind of ecosystem note, let me talk about the, debt, the future of Asian finance. The IMF, again, I congratulate them, did this, not a, sm not a smile. You know, in technology, you're supposed to have a smile. You know, you know, this is the frown. You know, you start off by being well, you reach a peak, and then you get into the Irish problem, US problem, Japanese problem, etc. There is a limit to financialization. <laughs> Actually, it's not financialization. There is a limit to debt. Okay? You know, equity is much better because equity means that if I die, if everything is Andrew Sheng, it's equity, I die, none of you uh, uh, is lending money to me, there's no systemic effect. Right? And if I lose my equity, that's lose my equity. But if I borrow and I put my pension into the bank deposit, the system is systemic. So, we need to think about finance and this is another of the most brilliant economists, uh, Andrew Haldane in the Bank of England. He demonstrated this as a pyramid. Financial markets are not equal. Okay? You know, this idea that everybody is equal in the market is absolutely wrong. How can you compete against the algorithm uh, fund manager? Better information, better technology, cheaper funds than you. By the time you go into the market, you've lost your money already, right? So in, in a sense, you need to look at individual, mark, individual banks, microprudential, layer two financial system, macroprudential, layer three economic system, monetary policy, and layer four international financial architecture. They're all related. My growth is yours, your growth, your growth is my growth. I'm, you know, we are interconnected uh, 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 and we need to think about. So now I want to talk a little bit about how technology is changing this. We're changing this because the technology is moving in digi digital disruption, digital waves. And never in my lifetime could I dreamt, right, that the whole world now operates on internet. I could not have imagined this. But it has happened, and the disruption is huge. Let me make a very bold statement. If it wasn't for regulation, if it wasn't for regulation, fintech would have already taken over a lot of the business of the banking system, right? But regulation is protecting this uh, system. Now, the technology is even more exciting because blockchain, which was made famous by Bitcoin, which is uh, some hacker, you know, genius, probably invented this stuff, realized that if I have an algorithm that actually ensures that the, it cannot be the, the fraud, okay, the two of us can trade on a bilateral basis without using currency. So technically speaking, blockchain technology can disintermediate even central banks. It's become so dangerous that the central banks are saying we should ban this, right? But, and of course, you know, uh, Bitcoin has a problem because Bitcoin valuation is unstable, okay? But the technology of blockchain is changing the game, changing the game, because it enables you know, encryption and, and mathematics that I don't understand that will ensure that the fraud that currently goes on in many markets you know, can be eliminated. The funding of investments is changing with crowdfunding, right? In Silicon Valley, FinTech is now raising 12 billion in uh, 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 nearly $20 billion in 2015. And the Indians got it right. The Indians suddenly realized. Uh, as you know, the Indians got rid, uh, the Modi came in, he got rid of the planning commission. He said, we don't need planning. We need instead NITI, IO. NITI stands for National Institute for Transforming India. And the first thing they thought about was not about a bunch of very bright technocrats designing the strategy for India. 
they got market people, people from the villagers, etc., a group of people to start thinking, how do we transform India using the latest technology? And they came up with a bottom-up approach because they said something that development economists in the West never understood, which is, in Chinese, you would know this. The Chinese saying is, hang hang chu zhuang yuan, which means that in every business, you get a genius. So what the Indians did was, there must be a genius in the rural areas, in agriculture, in fisheries, in mining, but we don't know who's going to be the genius. So what are we going to do? We're going to train them on entrepreneurship and innovation. And once these guys understand what can be done, then they will be the next big Uber, BNB, etc. Right? And that's why they say, trust the people bottom up. Now, you know, you, you know from fintech, the branch are disappearing, the digital component has growing share of global flows in the information, etc. And so we have huge changes. So let me very quickly conclude because I'm running short of time, right? Asia is in the midst of a wonderful transformation. The West doesn't get it. The West saying, you know, China is not doing this, India is not doing that, ASEAN, you know, has all these problems. Wrong. 600 million people of the middle class are learning through the internet, through, through the, 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 the access to technology, to create the fourth industrial revolution where only less than 50 million people in the last century or, the, or two, 200 years before created the industrial revolution. Just think, in Europe a small group of people went through science and technology and conquered the rest of the world. And now six to eight hundred million people in Asia are now getting the same knowledge. Game change, game over. Okay, so I'm very hopeful on what's happening. The governance issue is another issue, and that's what Asia is, 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 is rethinking. <coughs> so, you know, we need to get rid of this excess credit creation, the tax biases and all this. We need to think about this. We need to shift towards an equity base because we are net lenders. We are net borrowers, not net borrowers. Give you a simple illustration. In China, you said, oh, this debt number is terrible. The Japanese have been living with these debt numbers for the last 25 years. The reason is very simple. It's the left hand owing the right hand. And the banking system is 90% owned by the state, lending to state-owned enterprises and local government, 100% owned by the state. So it's the left hand writing to lending to the right hand. And the, the debt contract can be an equity contract overnight, switched up the game. Right? And if you want to make the banking system very dynamic, tomorrow under one rule change, you can give the fintech companies control of the banks. You change the game, banking system. <laughs> now, this cannot happen under a rule of law in uh, many other market-based economies, but in China, this state owned. So I'm just giving you ideas that you need to think beyond the conventional way of thinking to these issues. We are living in the information age. Information knowledge is getting cheaper and cheaper, faster and faster, so the young will change much faster than before. And the trouble is, with old, old guys like me, I don't understand this technology. But I was very hopeful because of, of the baby of a friend of mine was given a picture by the father, and what did the baby do? <laughs> The baby understood iPad better than me, and the, but even the father. They think about this in a very different world. So what we need to do now is to create the ecosystem for the young to plug into this global technology and leapfrog advanced countries. Because what the advanced countries went through was somewhat painful. But if governance-wise, politics-wise, I'm not an expert in that area, in the finance area, I'm totally convinced Asia can get its act together and will change the world. So finance cannot be a, a, a through debt. It has to be through equity. And we need to restore this balance. And I'm very hopeful that you know, Singapore will play a very major role. And somebody in this room will be the next Alibaba creator. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>